Today on Dirt Lifestyle, we've got a whole bunch of work ahead of us. We're back to doing builds. I'm gonna continue to do adventure videos, folks, but I have been wanting to get back to my roots for a while. We finally have some fun parts in these brown boxes over here. We've got an engine and a transmission and a transfer case that need to come out of this Jeep, so we need to get started. Many of you who follow the channel know that last spring when I was out in Moab, Utah, I damaged the engine in my diesel swap TJ somehow. I just over revved it. There was a malfunction probably in the pedal. And this has left me with some really smoky startups. What many of you don't know is that in the last four years since I swapped this diesel engine, this transmission has slowly been getting harder and harder to shift. So in today's video, I wanna try and fix both problems. I wanna install a brand new transmission that's rated a lot higher torque, it's got better gear ratios, and at the same time, I wanna try and fix this engine, and if we can fix it, I'd like to add nitrous. There's a few things you can do if you're doing an engine swap that's gonna make it way easier, and one of those, if you have a Jeep TJ or a CJ or a YJ, Pull your grill off, pull your fenders off, just get everything clean, and then it's way easier to do an engine swap. In this case, because we already have this engine installed and I've already got so much wiring and all this stuff routed through and around the fenders, we're gonna leave all that stuff on um, if we can. I'm probably gonna pull the radiator just for clearance, but we actually, this engine's so small, we have quite a bit of room in here to work around. So I think once we pull all of our plumbing and everything out of the way, disconnect all of our electrical, this should come out relatively easily. So that's one piece of advice. Another piece of advice, if you've never pulled an engine before, is get yourself a cart, clean that cart off, put all the tools that you think you're gonna need right there on the cart. So obviously I need to clean this out. But once we get all the tools that we're gonna to need to pull this engine out, and it's just right there in the cart, it's gonna make this a lot easier to do our work and not have the sides just lined with like sockets and all the stuff that falls into the engine bay. I'm gonna pull the engine transmission and transfer case today because since we're adding the new transmission and it has to marry perfectly to the transfer case and perfectly to the engine, I would rather troubleshoot any potential issues outside of the vehicle instead of having to constantly push a transmission back in, try to bolt something up and pulling it back out. It's weird having that TDI out of there. It's I put that in there four years ago, way before YouTube, way before any of that. So it's interesting to have it back in this position. Anywho, I am not sure if I'm gonna remove this grill yet or not. It's gonna be so much easier to put the engine in and out if I do, but I just did a little experiment pulling the engine transmission out as one because I'd like to put the engine transmission back in as one. Uh, I could do it, but it's it's not very clean being able to go over this. I just have a, there's a bunch of stuff going across there that I don't wanna have to mess with. So we'll see, I'm gonna think about that. But we've got uh, all of our ingredients for Nate's TDI TJ broke apart on the floor here. We've got an Atlas four speed transfer case. We've got the stock NV3550 out of the Jeep TJ. And then we've got this uh, BRM TDI out of a 2006 Volkswagen Jetta. So I'm gonna get cleaned up and then I wanna talk about today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Tecron, and if you followed many of the other shop videos that I do that are, that are sponsored by Tecron, I like to try to cover something that's informational, right? I don't want this to just be a big commercial. And so today, what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about emulsifiers. Emulsifiers are super important things to understand, and they used to be all the rage. When I first started doing the uh, automotive thing, right when I graduated high school, emulsifiers were pretty popular in those days, but they've recently become a lot less popular, and for a good reason. So what an emulsifier does is it allows gasoline and contaminants in your fuel tank to mix because if you're, especially if you're traveling cross country, you go to a couple shady gas stations, there could be some stuff in their tanks that are now gonna be in your tank. And emulsifiers seemed like an easy way to get rid of unwanted water and moisture and contaminants and stuff in your tank because gasoline does not mix with water very well, but it does mix with alcohol just fine and water mixes with alcohol just fine. So once you put the emulsifier in there, it allows everything to just turn into like a big slurry mess 
that you can then digest through your fuel system. But modern fuel systems do not like this stuff. You've got a lot of really expensive, really sensitive components in a modern engine that emulsifiers are not gonna be good for you. So my recommendation, if you have contamination in the fuel tank, if you think you got bad gas, you're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way. Drop the tank, dump all the nonsense out and refill it with brand new gas because emulsifiers are not good and Tecron does not use emulsifiers. There are still fuel additive companies that use emulsifiers. Tecron is not one of them. And this is one, another one of the reasons that I really like using Tecron and all the vehicles that I drive. So the next thing on the agenda, we've got one, two, three, four cylinders. We're gonna do a compression test. I wanna make this motor right before we start to marry it to this transmission and then see if the transfer case is gonna marry to the transmission, all that kind of stuff. I wanna make sure that our motor is all good to go. So as we do the compression test, we'll write our results down here. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, the F and the R, those are my drive shaft lengths. I took measurements before I pulled everything because we're putting a new transmission in it and that could change things. And I wanna make sure with my drive shaft company, uh, the company that I work with, I wanna make sure that whatever the change is, uh, these drive shafts are either gonna, either gonna work or if they aren't gonna work, then I need to send them out to get it modified. Compression test really took me by surprise. I couldn't believe how low the numbers were that I was getting, but then later on as I was thinking about it, I realized that it's because of the aftermarket cam. The duration definitely messed with our ability to test full pressure in these cylinders. So I decided to just pull the head so I could do a visual inspection of the pistons and of the valves and make sure that everything is in operating order and that this motor is worth my time. Let's take a look at this motor. So, we kind of have more questions and some answers. Did the, did the valves hit the pistons like I originally thought? No, we would see evidence of that and there's zero evidence of that. These pistons actually look great. Um, however, one of these was not running right. You could just tell when it was idling and it was cold and it was the rear because the, the front three look identical and they actually look really clean, but this one right here, it's a little bit grody. There's a lot of buildup and whatnot on it. it. It just doesn't look right. So another thing that I've noticed is that around these three cylinders, uh, it looks pretty uniform. They all look the same. Whereas this one, it gets dark right here where the, uh, the, the head gasket might have failed. So I think that it could have been leaking compression, a little bit of compression when it was cold into basically like where the oil drains by. So there's that, that could be a possibility, right? And then it would just turn into blow by. You wouldn't notice like there wouldn't be oil in your coolant or coolant in your oil or, or any of that. It could have just been leaking a little bit of compression. And then once the engine got up to operating temperature and it got warm, it would seal this off enough that it would, it would run right when you're driving down the road. So that's possibility number one. Possibility number two, my friend Josh is a Volkswagen mechanic He's a day night rebuild. He is outstanding. And I called him when this happened, when I was in Moab. And uh, as soon as I described everything, he's like, that sounds like an injector problem, dude. <laughs> so all the valves look great. Um, there's no cracks in between the valves. That's something that's common with like older Volkswagens that get high miles. Um, but these, these look mint. I mean, honestly, it looks really good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just to be certain I'm gonna pull all the injectors, I'm gonna send them to a place to have them bench tested because I wanna know when I put this engine back together that the injectors are golden. I don't wanna install bad parts. Plus, that will rule out the possibility that the injector seals, uh, like the rear one hasn't failed and it's losing compression that way. Because if we put brand new seals in it when we put the fully functional injectors back in, we'll know that we can knock that out as a possibility. I, I think I should tear apart the bottom end. What do you guys think? I'm, uh, I'm not gonna do it right now. 
but I'm thinking that we already have this engine stripped down this far, right? It would be smart to pull the pistons out, inspect all of our rings, and make sure we don't have a cracked ring. Because if we have a cracked ring, we know that's the problem. But if all the rings look good, all I have to do is compress the rings back down, put them all back in. I'm not, I wouldn't even replace the bearings or anything. I would literally just bolt everything back up. Um, it, you know, it's just time. And it's worth it to me, so we don't have to get down to this point again. So I'm curious what your theories are. This is where I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's either head gasket. Uh, it could still be a, uh, a bad ring maybe back there, but again, revving it to basically making it bang rev limiter for a few seconds does not usually destroy rings. So I don't think it's rings, but I'm just saying that could be a possibility or head gasket or injector. So I don't, I think that whatever happened with the injector could just be coincidence. It might not have had anything to do with me over revving Moab, but uh, anyway, I guess if I send them out and we get a report back after they've been bench tested, then we'll be able to go from there. I look tired. <laughs> I am tired. I did three videos last week. I did two videos this week and plus my Patreon videos. So I am shot. And uh, so I'm going to, this is going to feel short for you, but you know, this is a lot of work to do by yourself, pulling out that drivetrain and all this. I'm beat and I want to go hang out with my wife and kiddos for the night and the morning because tomorrow I'm leaving on another three day trip. So I need to lick my wounds and get back to reality. Questions that I'm going to have. People are going to ask what transmission I got and why. It's a Tremec 4050. I got it from Silver Sport Transmission. It comes with all these adapters and everything to bolt right into a Jeep TJ. So we're going to see what kind of modifications we have to do to make it marry to this TDI. But we'll probably look into that in the next episode, depending on what stuff I have. If I have the stuff to put the motor back together, we'll do that in the next episode and then maybe start to marry. We'll, we'll see where we get next week. Next week, I'll be able to put a lot more days into this this project than I did this week. I, and I, I'm just shot. I just got to be honest. I'm, I'm beat. So uh, other questions I'm going to get. I mentioned nitrous. We're going to do nitrous on this. So at some point in this little series of re refixing the TJ, we're going to mount nitrous. We're going to get on the whiteboard. We're going to talk about how nitrous works in a diesel. We're going to talk about how I sized the shot of nitrous because we have a bunch of different orifices that will change the amount of uh, nitrous that we're going to deliver to this Jeep. And we'll talk about why I decided to do nitrous instead of a bigger turbo and all that. So we've got all that. And for those of you that are here for fabrication, I will be doing some fabrication because we're going to have to rebuild. We're going to have to build our own transmission mount for this new setup. And then we're going to build our new skid system that's going to uh, match all this. And we'll talk about how the old skid system performed because believe it or not, I get questions about that old because I only used eighth inch. I got questions about that all the time. So We'll go over that. We'll talk about what design I'm going to try to do this time because I'm always trying to experiment and this will be fun. This is going to be a short series. It'll be like three or four episodes, but it's going to be a fun series. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Thumbs up, likes, high fives, all that other stuff you do to YouTubers that you enjoy watching. And uh, I'm going to go hang out with the family and get some rest. For those of you that uh, don't know, we've got another fan ride coming up on Patreon this month. So if that's something you're interested uh, in Washington, then uh, join us on that, on that community. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.